we typically in our class talk about um, natural disasters and, and hurricanes and, and floods and all that kind of stuff, but obviously um, human-induced disasters can also be um, a major problem. And so what we're seeing unfold right now, uh, as of yesterday, is this um, horrible event in, um, on the East Coast near Washington, D.C. in Baltimore. So um, I'll play you guys a little video here. Oops. Welcome to the news hour. Search and rescue efforts are underway in Baltimore after a major commuter bridge collapsed there overnight. Officials say six people remain unaccounted for. In the middle of the night, a container ship slowly trying to exit Baltimore's outer harbor rams into a support beam of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And all at once, the towering 1.6 mile long structure plummets into the river below. Never would you think that you would see physically see the key bridge tumble down like that. It looked like something out of an action movie. That's where the key bridge used to be. By sunrise, the scope of the disaster came into full view. The on-ramp severed. The cargo ship buried beneath the bridge's mangled truss. Investigators are still seeking answers to what happened. Maryland Governor Wes Moore. I know this has been a long night. We started coordinating immediately after the key bridge collapsed. The preliminary investigation points to an accident. We haven't seen any credible evidence of a terrorist attack. A few minutes before impact, the ship's lights went out. Operators put out a mayday that the vessel had lost power, giving police time to divert traffic from the bridge before the collision. Many of the vehicles were stopped before they got onto the bridge, which, uh, which, which uh, saved lives in a, in, a, in a very, very heroic way. Still, sonars detected several cars in the water, and authorities say a crew had been repairing potholes on the bridge when it collapsed. Maryland's Secretary of Transportation said a massive search and rescue is underway. We're basically searching for, for everyone that was potentially on the bridge. As you can imagine, it's the middle of the night, you know, what type of traffic was there, uh, how many workers were there. President Biden said today that he intends to have the federal government pay to rebuild the bridge. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though, to stick with them at every step of the way. The Key Bridge was one of three interstate crossings of the Patapsco River, which is a tributary of the Chesapeake. The remaining two are both lower clearance tunnels. The wreck has already snarled commuter traffic as well as shipping traffic in and out of Baltimore. But experts say other harbors along the East Coast can handle the pressure. Baltimore is, is not one of the bigger container ports in the region. Okay, so, um, so this is what happened, right? So uh, they, they just announced this morning that they were able to remove the um, data logger, the so-called black box, and, um, and, and so they'll have better ideas. Apparently this vessel had lost power previously, and, uh, or there was some power issues in when it was in Europe um, and so it's unclear if you know what was going on specifically to cause the power failure but clearly what happened was <clears throat> there was a power failure and, th and they lost the ability to navigate how these port things typically work is um, a, the captain is responsible for the ship when you're out at sea and then whenever you get uh, to a port you usually have a pilot or a series of pilots that come on board so the captains are responsible for knowing how their ships travel across the ocean and how to deal with hurricanes and you know blah 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 and all that kind of stuff and and how to have the um, cargo properly stored on the vessel etc. But um, because people go all around the world because this is an international um, system of shipping, not every captain understands every port. Some ports are very simple, um, such as our port Wainimi is very very simple. Um, others are quite complex with um, infrastructure with changing tides, with um, you know shoals, all, all kinds of potential navigation hazards, and so um, pilots come on board. So pilots would meet the vessel out at sea or or near the river mouth or wherever. They would um, board the vessel and they would take control. So the pilots both. Um, so the captain's there, but the pilot is the is the person in charge of saying um, you know. Go, go, go right, go left, you know, stop, that kind of stuff. And so uh, pilots are on board the vessel until it docks. And then the same thing when a vessel leaves 
port. The a pilot is also on the vessel to get them out, and then once they're out of the, <coughs> the port facility, the, the navigation hazard, then uh, uh, a tug that's nearby, usually they'll get on the tug and, and go. Um, uh, so yeah, so, so this particular bridge was built in the 1970s when these vessels were much smaller. And this is a story with a lot of our infrastructure, right? We see this with wildfire, we see this with um, uh, floods, all this kind of stuff. We built our infrastructure for a system that is different than our system right now. And so, um, and so this is a graphic from the Wall Street Journal, which I think it, it nicely illustrates this. So this is, um, right, so the vessel came and essentially whacked this support column. And this vessel is massive. Essentially, this vessel is almost as long as the bridge is. And it's almost as wide as it is tall. And so to give you a sense, so we're here in Sierra Hall. So, so this graphic says three Statue of Liberties. It's six Sierra Halls, um, uh, the length of this vessel, right? Loaded with huge amounts of cargo. So there's a massive uh, momentum thing going on here, right? So to get this thing to move is, is a challenge. It was moving relatively fast at about eight knots, which, is, which seems maybe a bit fast for, for that, but I, I, don't, I don't particularly know the, the specifics of that port um, situation. But basically, um, uh, this vessel, or excuse me, this bridge was built when these vessels were a third that size. Uh, the typical vessel was a third that size. And the idea there is, um, uh, well, there's probably nothing that could, so this is the support uh, structure that was um, crushed, that we saw in the video, that crushed and then everything crumbled. And then once this crumbled, the whole thing, the whole thing was just, you know, doomed. En Engineering-wise, it all needs, it, it, um, it can't be supported by just one of these pilings kind of thing. Uh, and so um, pretty much probably there was nothing to, there, there's no engineering, um, there's no buttress or no armoring or something like that we could probably build to take that momentum out. I mean, this is an insane amount of energy when, when this thing was going. So as it was coming through the port, what seems to have happened, as it was coming through the port like around here, it seemed it started to have some electrical issues, and um, thankfully the only the only bright side here is that the crew realized what was going on, and that's what that that last little bit of the video. That's why I wanted to show you that one because that one sort of shows the few minutes before it hit the bridge. A lot of the videos that's circulating just show it hitting the bridge, um, and you see the power go off. So the so the so the electricity died, and so obviously all the control systems and things died. Um, uh, they were able to, and then kind of went on for a little bit, uh, it kind of came back and then died again and then like apparently stayed off is what it sounds like. Um, and so they were able to use their emergency radios, which have their own power sources, and said, hey, like we can't control this big giant vessel going towards this bridge. And so, so uh, thankfully the um, police and the port officials were able to shut off the bridge and, and not let more, there, I mean, there were some people on the bridge, but, but not let more people get on the bridge. And so unfortunately, it sounds like um, six of the folks that passed away were on a road crew filling potholes in the middle of the bridge. And you know, you know how that goes, probably super loud, like who's, like, who's that guy? I don't know, we gotta figure out who to call, right? So, so there were some um, logistical challenges in reaching those folks, but, but it's very clear if these folks had not, if the, um, uh, folks trying to steer the vessel had not alerted the authorities. There had been way more vehicles on that um, bridge, um, and, and, and almost assuredly a much higher uh, death toll. So, so, um, so that's what's going on there. Um, uh, and and so to remind you what we talk about in terms of a, a, a cycle uh, phases of disaster. So talk about prevention in a second, but um, but. Um, Basically, we're in the response phase right now. So we haven't gotten in the recovery. So all these, so this, right? This is what it looks like right now, right? We have, we have the, the, the port physically blocked. Uh, there's, there's obstructions in the water. Um, and uh, the active searching for folks to save people, that officially ended last night. And people, and the, the uh, emergency management system folks are say, saying we're in a recovery mode. So rather than trying to, to 
help people were trying to get the bodies and, and start to uh, collect information for um, uh, the understanding of what happened for the, for the incident report and that kind of stuff. Once that happens, once the data has been gathered and any evidence has been collected, um, probably very quickly, probably in a you know, day or two, then they'll um, work on starting to figure out how to probably first free this, free this um, vessel and then next um, carve up some amount of this stuff so there could be a passage so the rest of the, the port could at least be um, working. It'll obviously be you know, probably years before the bridge is actually repaired. Um, but that's not, that, that's not the concern at this point. The concern at this point is shutting down a, a port. So, um, and, and why this has ramifications for us other than just very sad and, and, and you know, uh, horrible for the folks in Baltimore, in the Baltimore area, um, is in the wake of the pandemic, as we've all seen, stuff is still not back to normal in terms of ordering stuff. So has anybody ordered things of late and, and found problems or found the product not available or they have like a super long wait time? Yes? Yes? Okay. Um, so uh, that's not recovered. So before the pandemic, um, all the brilliant business planners that just knew everything about the world, and we'll tell you how things should work, um, they, we used to have a system in our country and most of the world where we would have um, inventory. So if you were selling radios or whatever, you would have a warehouse of radios. And then, and then you have your store selling the radios, but, but you know, you'd have a supply of radios there. Essentially, in the last few years, um, the decision was made that, that that was wasteful, that there were, essentially, that there were, um, that was inventory that you was, was sitting on your shelves that you weren't using. So, so we switched to what's called the just-in-time um, uh, 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 supply chain. So what that means is rather than have a big inventory, you have a Small, small inventory, or sometimes even no inventory, and then when you're like, oh my gosh, I need a radio, you, you call up whomever and you go, hey, you know, next week I'm gonna need 10 radios or whatever, right? And then and those things are shipped from the, from the manufacturer to you or, or to your company. Um, and so that, so that works fine when we have a super connected and super functioning and highly um, you know, back and forth uh, uh, global economy. But obviously in the pandemic, things got stopped because people couldn't, people were worried about um, getting sick and so people were social distancing and we were shutting down plants and all that stuff just got kind of wacky, right? Um, and, and these things have massive consequences, right? So the Huntington Beach oil spill was absolutely caused by that supply chain disruption. So our ports got so screwed up, typically our ports, our, our biggest port in, on the West Coast is LA Long Beach typically be five, 10 uh, uh, cargo vessels like this vessel waiting to get into the port, like, like all the slots might be full, all the terminals might be full, so kind of be waiting. Um, right before the Huntington Beach spill happened two years ago, there was over 100. And in fact, we filled up all the essentially parking lots, the, the ship parking lots outside of the port, and ships were just anchoring willy-nilly, and that's and one of those sh ships dragged anchor and ripped up a pipeline, and that's what called the caused the Huntington Beach oil spill. So there's all kinds of consequences to this stuff. It's not just a business issue. And, and this, and so, so we haven't fully recovered from that, right? Some things have recovered, but we still have this very sort of um, squirrely supply chain. So some of the items that we use for our microplastics monitoring, for example, um, are still, like, for the last two years, when you go to the website, it just says, you know, unavailable or, or out of stock or something like that, right? Um, and it's not just a problem for us and talking with colleagues at Amgen, you know, big, huge biotech firm, deep pockets, they can't get uh, uh, certain, um, you know, petri dishes and things like that that they need as well. So this is, a, this is a huge problem. So this, while it's a relatively small port on the East Coast, relatively far from us, um, there could possibly be some ramifications for us because that's gonna screw up some of, the, some of the supply chain of stuff going into, I don't know, somebody that's making your TV that's in Virginia or, you know, or some, something of that nature. So um, there's potentially long tails uh, for these events. And so, uh, so we're, we're basically in the, in the response phase, but if we talk about the prevention and mitigation, um, the most important bridge uh, 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 disaster of this type um, happened uh, in, the, in the 80s in 1980, and this was in Florida, 
and essentially a, a similar scenario where we had um, in St. Uh, Petersburg where we have a bridge over, a, a sort of a span bridge over this inlet of uh, this port and a uh, shipping cargo container essentially rammed the, the support structure and it, and it caused the thing to collapse. So many more folks died and it was a big, it was a big sort of um, wake up call to sort of, uh, you know, how, how might we design things differently. Again, this is after that Francis Scott Key Bridge was built. So the Francis Scott Key Bridge was built in the 70s. This event happened in the 80s. But both of these things were a different generation, right? A different era of vessels. And so, so it's a real challenge when we talk about these issues of, of, of this prevention and, and all that when, when you know, we've, our, our case studies come from historic situations that are maybe no longer the case. We typically think of, of climate change and rainfall patterns or wind change, you know, hurricane uh, patterns and changes like that. But, um, but it, it's many, it's all aspects of our infrastructure and, our, and how we've built to that. So, um, so that's what's going on there. So we'll see, I think you saw in that little video, a, a whole, even though it's just the very first early part of this disaster, um, uh, all the same things, right? The, ma the mayor is saying like, oh my God, it's like a disaster movie, right? We, we have all the same phrase, like I can't believe it was real. This doesn't seem, this seems like a movie. This doesn't seem, it seems very surreal. And all those kind of phrases are, are, are the first thing to say. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, so that's, that's where we are with this particular disaster. Um, any questions you guys had about that or any, any observations you guys have made in looking at the news the last day? Anything uh, thinking about our class or? or any insights you guys might have been taking away or wondering about? No. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, actually, real quick, um, I have noticed that there is a bit of an air of like misinformation around this disaster too. Oh, like, good. So tell me like what? What example? Uh, just like, yeah, conspiracy theories. What we talked about uh, happens with like most disasters that like, oh, this was planned, or oh, this is for some nefarious agenda. Like from both sides, like the political aisle, like mostly in, cause like I get most of my news, not most of my news, but I see a lot of stuff like on Instagram, TikTok, mm -hmm. like in those comment sections, like a lot of pretty serious looking comments, like, oh, to distract us from something, oh, yeah. Like just going back to what we talked about with other disasters that, yeah, misinformation yeah, so, so um, yeah, no, good, good observation. I think that um, that is increasingly the sea we're swimming in, unfortunately, right? So it, it, uh, the monetization of your eyeballs is the only real driver in most of these, in most of these social media platforms, despite what they say, right? So, so really they want you to pay attention and Conspiracy theories and salaciousness and and you know craziness um, makes people watch more and and so you guys are the product right so so your time is 100% the product so they're trying to um, to use you and there's a new wave now of of brain sensors coming on the, on the line with where that'll be even probably crazier but um, Chris Kristen question. Uh, what, what has Uh, so it's, um, uh, so you're talking about like the vessel owner? Yeah. So Maersk is the, uh, let's see, is it, you can see it in the picture. I don't know if you can see it in this picture. I guess you can't see it in this picture. But um, so the vessel is uh, owned by um, the second largest shipping company in the world, uh, Maersk. And so is it Sri Lankan? I thought it was, I thought it was Singaporean. I, 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 well, yeah. so, so, um, uh, this gets into issues with, that we talk about uh, more in like our coastal management class, but I'll just say that um, uh, also back in the day, this vessel would have been, um, uh, you know, a U.S. flagged vessel or a uh, you know, flagged in Rotterdam or, or one of the major ports. Um, uh, this particular vessel, I think, is registered with in Singapore, um, which 
uh, is somewhat unusual. Many of our vessels are, f are flagged in, are, um, the, the, their home port essentially is, uh, are places like Liberia um, and these um, small nations that don't really have a massive infrastructure, and that's to avoid taxes. So that, 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 that's all to, and so the term is called international flags of convenience. So even though the crew might be Filipino and the captain might be American and the, the engineers might be, um, I don't know, Norwegian or something, um, they'll be, you know, it'll say Liberia on the back and they'll be flying a Liberian flag. And, and, and oftentimes that's used to hide things and to avoid and to save costs. And also fairly common, um, I don't know about this particular vessel, I'm not trying to be disparaging about the owners here, but, but I don't know the story, but, but many, many times there are shell companies within shell companies within shell companies that, that manage these vessels so that when they, and most typically I see this with the oil spill. So when one of these vessels poorly maintained breaks up and then has a, you know, either breaks down and runs onto a reef or, or, or rips open or whatever because of poor ma uh, maintenance, um, you can't find who the owner is or whatever. Um, in this case, this is, um, I think this is, this is not one of those cases. I think this is a, 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 you know, more robustly understood in terms of ownership. The owners, I believe, have just said they're fully cooperating and, and they're, they're um, you know, s sending information to the authorities and everything. We're just really starting that process in the last probably 12 hours, so it's still a little bit early. I suspect since they've pulled the, the ship's recorder, um, it'll, it'll be a lot easier to understand. And because like the ship is a little effed up right here, right? Um, but it hasn't sunk. Right, so whatever the issue was with the power, we'll be able to figure that out pretty pretty quickly, right? If this had sunk to the bottom of the of the channel, that would be maybe a different story. But um, but this should be a fairly straightforward understanding, at least approximate issue. What what still is not, and, and this is not even the biggest ship in the world, right? This is this is a big ship, but there are are bigger ships, right? And so, um, for example, in our port of L.A. Um, Long Beach. Uh, uh, some of the w some of the terminals are built for the world's largest vessels. Those largest vessels cannot go through things like the Panama Canal and things of that nature because they're just too they're just too gigante. I mean, they're just they're massive. They're insane. Um, and so, so with that new infrastructure, uh, with the speed at which things scale up, um, you need to sort of scale up other things, but you know, building a bridge, come on, man, like you build a bridge once every 50 or 100 years, you don't build a bridge every five, 10 years. And so there's, there's a bit of a, um, of a disconnect between these things. In our case, our local port, Port Wainimi, is the only deep water port between Los Angeles and San Francisco. And it, um, it can service uh, um, essentially vessels that go way down in the water, that have a deep draft. Um, and so, uh, but it's relatively small, right? So it's, it's for very specialized stuff. So our local port does bananas, cars, blueberries. Um, uh, yeah, those are the main things we, we specialize in uh, here. Um, so our port is, is much more of a specialized port as opposed to serving everybody, doing all kinds of stuff. Whereas LA, uh, uh, um, LA Long Beach is, is like, that. they do everything. There's, there's shipping containers and there's other things and all that kind of jazz. 